Welcome back to the Ed Morrissey Show podcast, and welcome back to a friend of mine. I haven't talked to him in a long time, Matt Lewis. And this is a perfect time, by the way, to talk to Matt Lewis of The Daily Beast, because he's got something out that's not just at The Daily Beast. He's got a brand new book out called Filthy Rich Politicians. Uh, (laughs) And what a time to be having this come out right in the middle of House hearings about Oh, a particular family of filthy rich politicians who uh, operate 20 different LLCs and uh, have money moving around all over the place. Uh, Matt, um, I- I'm sure that the book is not about that because that would be a whole book unto itself. Yeah. But I mean, you know, first off, congratulations on your new book. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's good to see you. It's good to talk to you. And uh, the the Bidens do make an appearance, including Hunter. But um, but you're right that they, you know, they constitute a small percentage of of the filthy rich politicians talked about in the book. Well, there's two different aspects of this, right? I know that your book is going to get into both of these, but there's really two different aspects. One is that we're electing the wealthy. Now, that's not new. I mean, we we were electing Kennedy's. We're electing the Cabot Lodges. You know, the you know, we're electing we've been electing wealthy people since the beginning of the republic, really. Uh, um, But these days, I think we're electing the wealthy to get around the idea that, you know, <laughs> you need to fundraise, which is a whole other topic in and of itself about, you know, in politics, but yeah, you know, you, that you need to actually organize. You just get somebody in who can self fund and both parties yeah. you know, are really trying to find the self funders, the wealthy people who want to uh, become the new Kennedys, the new Cabot lodges. Yeah. Um, we've always had rich politicians. There is a difference, though, Ed, and part of the difference is in the past we had, you know, rich presidents, maybe rich U.S. senators. But in recent years, it has become the lowly House of Representatives, the lower chamber that also has become filthy rich. And so now uh, I think 2014 was the first time where the average member of Congress is a millionaire. Right now, the average member of Congress is about 12 times richer than the median American household. And so uh, even though we've always had rich politicians, the gap between them and us has widened. And I I think you're absolutely right. And one of the reasons is because uh, to the degree that the political parties do any sort of recruitment or vetting these days, the one thing that they're really looking for are self-funders who can write big checks. So it's very I don't want to say self-selecting because someone's doing the selecting, uh, but the incentives are all for attracting people who are rich. And by the way, have time to run for office. It's not just that they have the money, but can't, taking a year to campaign, most middle class folks I know couldn't do that. You know, it's interesting. The, the, the distinction that you make here between the House and the Senate and, and the presidency is interesting because the House has always been the idea of the house has always been the, the populist branch, right? The, the, that's the, well, the house isn't a branch. The house is a chamber. It's a populist chamber. Whereas the Senate was the club, uh, you know, prior to the uh, 16th amendment, it was the uh, 17th amendment, excuse me. It was the state legislative club. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and they said, they, you know, they, the state legislatures primarily sent people to the, the Senate club now it's 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 popular it's a popular vote but it's it was it's been still a clubby sort of atmosphere in the senate whereas the house always really has had a different sort of um supposedly different sort of culture but i think we're kind of getting away from that in part because of the the wealth gap that's now opening up in in the house of representatives but also in the fact that you've got people who who just go to the house of representatives and then cling on for dear life over decades. I mean, yeah. you know, 90%, is it something 90, 91% of incumbents who choose to run for re-election generally win and they stick around for a very long time. Yeah, as I wrote in the book, you know, I, the founders envisioned that people would come to Washington, do a, a couple terms and then go back to the farm. But if you look at our, you know, the age of our politicians today, it's clear they'd rather buy the farm than go back to it. Um, so yeah, <laughs> by the had, farm in a literal sense, by the literally. way, not, well, not, 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 literally. not, not literally. by the farm in, in the sense of dying, but although a lot of them get carried out, you know, you know, horizontally out of Washington. Right. I mean, <laughs> yes, problem. Yeah. The average age is, 
is dead. Um, <laughs> so they uh, and and by the way, that I do have to you know I I, I I note this in the book, but it's worth mentioning that because the average age of a member of Congress is so old, that does skew the results a little bit, right? Because sure. older people tend to be wealthier. It takes them longer to accrue wealth. And so, it, it, you know, it's, but generally speaking, it, I think it's fair to say that that our politicians are a lot richer than we are. And the gap has been widening in recent years. And I think that's an important topic. And I, I go to some length in the book to talk about like, well, number one, why is this happening? Does it even matter? Should it matter? Why do rich people want to run? Like I might be on a beach. Why do they want to run? Um, and then I go through, you know, so there's time spent there, but I do think the more concerning part of yep. the book is the part you alluded to earlier, which is once people get elected, they almost always get richer. This is, I mean, you talk about you know, wealth acquisition, right? People, as people get older, they, they acquire wealth. Well, they do that in Washington too. And that, I mean, that was, that was a point you, you beat me to the segue. So <laughs> what I was just about to make, right. Which is, it's one thing to say, well, I'm a wealthy, I'm a wealthy person, you know, and no bless oblige or some other thing. I want to give back. I want to, I want to have public service, you know, so that I can, I can feel good about my wealth, that sort of thing. Um, but most of the time, what we're talking about here are people who come to Washington with a suitcase and a briefcase and go home with four houses and suitcases yeah. and brief briefcases stuffed with cash. And I'm not mentioning anybody in particular. Joe Biden, excuse me. I'm sorry. I'm not mentioning anybody in particular, Matt Lewis. But I mean, Joe Biden is not the only person <laughs> to whom this applies. Uh, totally. Um, so first of all, rich people tend to get richer. And so, you know, I'm looking at thinking of like Senator John Hoven from North Dakota, pretty boring guy. Uh, he was rich. He was the governor of North Dakota, very rich. Yes, she ran the North Dakota as a state bank, believe it or not. It's kind of a weird concept, but yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. He ran that. He was like the president of it or something. Um, and he's been in the Senate for like 12 years or something like that. And his wealth doubled during that time he went from being worth like 22 million to 44 million or something like that and but that's a case where i think rich uh, where i think that the rich get r richer in the you know like i don't think there's anything nefarious there i think that when you have 22 million dollars or whatever it was and you invest it there's interest and you have real estate property that's accruing value you're gonna get richer um and again, we could talk about that and we could talk about income inequality and that's a conversation. But the the worst part, I think, are people who are like trading on their positions to get rich. Right. And so I think in the old days, it's kind of a quaint idea now. Um, I'm sure it still happens. But in the old days, it would be like a politician would find out where they're going to build the highway and then he would buy up all the property around the highway. Um, and then, oh, all of a sudden that property is worth way more money, you know, like land speculation. Right. I think now insider trading is the new uh, concern. And there are lots of examples, bipartisan examples of, of members of Congress, like apparently or seeming to use inside information to make bets on the stock market. Yeah. And I think that that is a real concern. And actually, as your book's coming out, and you pointed this out to me, you've got um, a bipartisan effort in the Senate, which is unusual in and of itself, uh, to deal with one particular aspect of this, which is that um, uh, to to bar, uh, and this would, um, this would encompass everybody in both the legislative and executive branches, um, to bar them from owning stock in individual companies. Um, I mean, we this is something we ran into with Donald Trump, right? He didn't want to put his assets in a blind trust, as most presidents have done over the last, you know, few decades. Um, there are no, I don't believe there are requirements for blind trusts in either the House or Senate. It is done quite a bit uh, as, uh, you know, in terms of being beneficial politically, to say that I've got this sort of distance, but there's nothing requiring it as, as I, as I, I'm trying to yeah. recall, and, and I'm sure that's because no, you're, you're right, Ed. And and actually, until 2012, it wasn't even really illegal for them to engage in insider trading anyway. 
the 2012 right congress passed the stock act that that made it illegal to uh to engage in inside basically use inside information that you were the knowledge you gained from your job in congress to bet on the stock market but it still happens obviously and uh so my book comes out on look it's most likely a coincidence Ed. i'm sure it's a coincidence but um but my book it, it maybe it's a just fortuitous but my book comes out on tuesday and you know I'm going everywhere I can talking about how we have to ban members of Congress from betting on the stock market. And then 24 hours later, this news broke uh, that is it Senator Holly and uh, Gillibrand, I guess, are are introducing this bill that would essentially do the same thing. I hope it passes. I'm I'm all for it. Do you think, though, and here's the um, here's the question I have for you on this. I haven't seen this bill yet. I'm going to take a look at it later. And I haven't read your book yet either. I want to make sure everybody understands that. Uh, I'm coming at this just the way that everybody else is coming at this um, to to find out about the book. And I, I'm pretty much sure I'm, what I'm going to do is get it on Audible and listen to it in the car on my vacation, which starts next week. Um, but how solid do you think this is? Because, you know, the Stock Act was supposed to put an end to some of this stuff too. And I don't think it really did. And there's been some um criticism i guess you can say i don't want to say accusation but there's been some criticism uh, of this of the previous efforts by saying it's basically toothless and all it is is just a way of sort of deflecting attention away from the wealth acquisition that's still going on regardless say you know, if it's not the the congress person who's doing it it's their you know their spouse or their son or daughter and that sort of thing um, and there was one famous case, and I can't remember the, the uh, person's name. There was a Republican, House Republican from New York, who ended up getting prosecuted because he was passing along these tips. But yeah, but his, that's his information was not. He's the only guy, by the way, who 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 actually yeah. got in trouble, and and his information was actually not gleaned from his job. From he 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 also said like he had been like a board of director of a company. That's where I, this is my understanding. That's where he got his information did not even come from his job as a congressman. Um, but I could tell you some stories uh, from about Nancy Pelosi that yeah. I think are, are very uh, sketchy and swampy. I could tell you a story about Richard Burr that is arguably even more concerning because it it, it was about kind of profiting off of the COVID-19 pandemic. I remember when that came up. Yes. Yeah. So, and I don't know if you know this part, Ed, but um, not only did Burr, who was the chairman of the Intelligence Committee, who was privy to a lot of inside information that even normal members of Congress might not have, classified documents and briefings and all that, you know, not only did he dump his stock in things like Wyndham Hotels before most Americans realized how bad the pandemic was going to be, but he caught his brother-in-law. And within one minute of hanging up the phone with his brother-in-law, his brother-in-law calls his broker and dumps like his stocks. So that speaks to your point, Ed, uh, about how it's it's very difficult to to stop this corruption. Now, the good news is that my book, uh, Filthy Rich Politicians, I'm not just I don't just want to ban it for members of Congress. I want to ban it for their spouses and their immediate families. And this bill that's being introduced does all of that and goes even further um, banning congressional staffers from engaging in individual stock trading. And both of us, their bill and my book, <laughs> would, would allow mutual funds, which would be, sure. you know, that would still be fine, of course. Well, it's because you don't, if you're, if you're buying into a mutual, mutual fund, you're not actively trading. <laughs> you're, right. you're 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 buying you're buying shares in a mutual fund and the managers of that fund the fund managers are the ones that are making those decisions based on their own information um i want to ask you about something else though too and i'm sure you covered this in the book it's not all about stock you know manipulation you know insider training and stocks although i'm very certain that a great deal of wealth acquisition comes from that but a lot of this comes from you know, people who basically sell positions um, and, and you know, just, I would, I would call it like graft, like just plain old fashioned graft. Uh, people who are making uh, 
decisions on regula regulation and, and statutes based on the financial incentives that they gain from, from the players in those questions. Uh, that's a little easier to prove, by the way. That's a little easier to go after than, than stock you know, insider stock um, uh, trading. And you see this from time to time, right? I'm thinking here of um, William Jefferson, I think was the last one that I recall. Cold, cold cash, right? Cold cash, cold yeah. cash or dollar bill. I heard, I heard it yeah. called dollar bill Jefferson or cold cash because he stuck 90,000 in his freezer. Um, how much of it is that? How much of it is people, you know, getting, you know, structuring payments, you know, to, to avoid, you know, flat out graft, uh, but still getting the money from it. So, uh, Ed, I largely avoid that topic in this book. Um, okay. And partly because I'm focused on kind of what I'll call the banality of corruption. I'm not focused oh, on- good. Okay, yeah. Yeah. So I'm not focused on the things that are clearly illegal, like taking bribes or or well, Blagojevich, you know, trying to sell a Senate seat. Like, <laughs> like, that's already an effing, illegal. An effing valuable thing, pal. <laughs> Right, that was clearly illegal and and unethical. What I'm mainly focused on are things that are under the sort of the normal course of business, like that that politicians do that are very mostly legal or or maybe like gray areas. Like, for example, spreading the wealth around. Okay, that's one thing. Hunter Biden uh, is an obvious topic here. Jared Kushner might be an obvious topic here, but. There's so many politicians. Uh, I think Maxine Waters in one, I think it was 2021, paid her daughter like $80,000 in one year. Um, Ilhan Omar directed a mil actually millions of dollars to her husband's consulting firm. Yep. Uh, Ron, Ron Paul paid, I think, six members of his family um, in 2012, something like a total of $300,000. Here's an interesting one for you. I got this from The Atlantic, Ed. Um, Joe Biden in 1988, when Joe Biden was running for president, in 1988, he raised about $11 million. 20% of that went to the Biden family or companies that hired Biden family members. Right. So that's like one chapter of the book uh, to give you sort of an example. Like these, and these are things that are not illegal. And in fact, I think they're incredibly common. It's the way that politicians are using their uh, their positions to cash in and to feather the nests of their friends and family. And um, my argument is that it erodes, that it is contributing to ero you know, eroding trust in elected officials and giving people the sense that the game is rigged. Well, I, and this is the reason why I think, that, you know, I'm going to return to this topic. It's the reason why I think that people are sort of impulsively saying, well, we need people who can't be bought. Who can't be bought? People yeah. who are really super rich to start off with. Now, I don't know that I actually agree with that logic because I think people who are really wealthy enjoy getting even more wealthy. I mean, <laughs> one, of perks, one of the perks of being really wealthy is that you get to become even more wealthy, and that's yeah. that's a perk, you know. And uh, but it, but but I mean that is a common argument. Well, he can't be bought, and I I, I, I am not going to say that that only pertains to Donald Trump because it's not true. We've heard this argument um at various different levels about people who jump into races who are self-funding well i'm self-funding they will argue and their supporters will argue so i'm not beholden to to anybody i am be only beholden to the voters so this is a very common thing for people to say who are jumping in with their own money do you when you're looking at this do you find that those that those people somehow resist the siren call of the corruption, the banal corruption that you're talking about in your book? So I think it, number one, I think you're right, Ed, uh, that I think this argument tends to work, whether it's true or not. When yeah. people say like, I can't be bought by the fat cats in Washington and the corporate interest, because I'm, I think it works. Um, and generally speaking, I think that whether you're going to be corrupt or compromised has more to do with character and other issues course, yeah. than it does with your bank account. And so there's probably not much of a correlation. I, I do think um, that 
if I had to, if I had to choose who was more likely to uh, sort of exploit the system, it, I, th- I just think there's maybe different types of corruption, right? So like right. Nancy Pelosi makes less than $200,000 a year. She would have to work 500 years to <laughs> approve her current net worth. Um, and I well, that was her that, husband. That was, but that oh, was her right. husband's money, right? <laughs> <laughs> so I'd have to say that like what they're engaged in is um, – it's very swampy and very sketchy. And, and again, these are people worth like, you know, certainly over a hundred thousand, I'm sorry, over a hundred million dollars. Right. Um, and then, you know, you've got people like, well, here's what's interesting too, um, is someone like Marjorie Taylor Greene, who is someone who comes across as very populist. She's worth like at least $5 million. You know what I mean? So right, like yeah. even the sort of new, up 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 and coming like populists are still millionaires um the stuff they engage in uh, you know i i I just i just don't know if uh i i guess at the end of the day it's not about how much money they have it it's about you know character and other things well of course and i mean character goes into this there are certainly people who have come to washington and who have left with their character intact we just don't write books about them because because that's that's at least it used to be sort of a baseline expectation is that you come in there you do your job you leave you go back to what you're doing and you know we we do have you know examples of this um who was the senator from Oklahoma he passed away um not you know a few years Coburn and Coburn, Coburn. And all. yeah yeah you know, Dr Tom Coburn yeah uh, I think they talked him into doing one more term than he originally wanted to do and then mm-hmm. he said okay I'm done that's it. I've had enough of this. It's time to have somebody else come in here and do that. So you have people like that. But, you know, leaving Congress or leaving the executive branch doesn't put an end to this. And I know that your book talks about this. Oh, yeah. Is that is that once you've been in the club, so to speak, the, the possibilities are still endless even after you get out. How how, how do people cash in? Uh, when yeah, they so, well, and yeah. You want to talk about the banality of corruption? I mean, my book has a whole section on book deals and bulk book purchases, and we oh. won't even go into that. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh! Yeah, I mean, <laughs> it, I that's, mean, that's Matt death. I, that's that's rating death. Yeah, Matt and I are ink stained wretches when it comes to book deals. I'm telling you that right now. And look, I got all the money I was ever going to get out of that that book right up front. Everybody told me that they were all very they were all very cool about that, and I'm fine with it. But I wasn't getting thirteen million dollar bonuses either, yeah. and <laughs> you know how many books you'd have to that publishers would have to sell <laughs> to recoup thirteen million dollar bonuses. A lot of copies. It's, a lot of copies of Going Red. <clears throat> um, yeah. <laughs> or filthy rich politicians. Or filthy rich politicians. Yeah. Don't skip, don't even worry about Going Red. Let's make sure that the publisher gets the money back on filthy <laughs> rich politicians. <laughs> um. But to your point, Ed, something like a third or a quarter to a third of members of Congress, depending on the year, uh, will take the revolving door into the wonderful world of lobbying. Yeah. And they'll keep cashing in as lobbyists. And that doesn't even count the other politicians who lobby, but they just don't register as lobbyists. There's this thing called the Dasho loophole that lets them get away with that as long as they what a shock. walk a, a fine line. Um, then you've got the foundations, right? Like the Clinton Foundation, but other people, you know, congressmen, former congressmen can start foundations. You can keep the uh, the gig sort of going, the graph going that way. And then um, you can also, you know, I don't know if you remember this, Ed, or if you knew this, but it used to be up until 1991 is when I think it was grandfathered out. But members of Congress used to be able to keep their war chest. Like you could retire with $10 million in your campaign account and put that in your personal account and leave. You could literally keep your campaign money. Obviously, that's not allowed anymore. But what you can do, what you can do is keep it in the account and you can like over the course of many years, give it away, go to fundraisers or or it could even be a destination trip that Senator so-and-so has you come to a retreat and you give him X, you know, ten thousand dollars. And by the way, you can pay for your own flight to the event and to stay at a hotel with this campaign money from the campaign 
that you ran that you were supposed to run five years ago. So there's lots of ways that they can keep cashing in even after they've left office. Yes. <laughs> and, <laughs> and they're inventing new ways all the time. Um, yes. And I don't have a problem with lobbying, right? I mean, and I understand why, you know, why lobbying firms would hire former members of Congress because they have connections, because they know people, because they know who to talk to. I mean, that is also in Rod Blagojevich's uh, colorful terms, an effing valuable thing yes. for, for lobbyists. Um, and I know that there've been attempts to tamp that down, but I mean, really it's, um, I mean, there's just no, there's really been no serious effort to end the so-called revolving door to you know, K Street. Yeah. Um, and I want to, I want to talk about the foundation thing though, because I think that's a special case and I'm not sure how far you get into this, but you, you take a look at these foundations and the Clinton foundation is, this is very true of the Clinton foundation, especially the Clinton global initiative part of the Clinton foundation. And I think it was probably true of the Biden center at, uh, university of Pennsylvania, which is that they set up these foundations, politicians set up these foundations so that when they're in between offices, they can keep their campaign staff employed so that they have, so that their campaign staff doesn't go to work for anybody else. They don't lose, they don't lose that. I mean, that, that was really part of the whole Clinton foundation was just simply keeping the team around, especially after the 2007 uh, primary, which, you know, Hillary expected mm -hmm. a coronation then and didn't get it. And the Clinton Foundation kept all those people in place for the later run in 2016. Um, and I think that there's a lot of that going on with some of this foundation work, too, is is not just keeping staffers in place, you know, for the periods that you're, you may be out of office. And of course, this would be at the very highest levels. I mean, somebody who's in the House doesn't have probably doesn't have a foundation that does something like this. But um, but not only that, but to pay family members, to pay off, you know, cronies who are, you know, that, that who did you favors, that sort of thing. That doesn't necessarily result in personal wealth, but it's just as corrupt. Yes. And it's a, I have a chapter on the lifestyle, which is another thing uh, that they, they can live who cares if it's your money or not, if you live this high role in lifestyle. Um, but, you know, the other thing, the point you made, Ed, about how a, a lot of times these foundations are set up while they're kind of in between jobs, that's a, you know, that's sort of a shakedown as well. I mean, especially yes. with the Clinton Foundation, right? Everyone assumed that Hillary, not only would Hillary be the nominee in 2020, everyone, I'm sorry, in 2016, everyone assumed that in 2016, she would be elected president. So you had all this, not just all this money going to her, trying to maybe curry favor for the future, but foreign money going to yes. the Clinton Foundation. Right. Uh, so, you know, I've been a critic of Donald Trump, and rightly so, I would say. But what the Clinton, the Clintons really patented the, the, a lot of these moves in many ways early on. And uh, again, I think it has contributed to the sense that the game is rigged and that everyone does it. and. I think that's very detrimental. I go in the book, I go into sort of documenting some data on how, you know, as you know, Ed, I mean, trust in institutions have been declining since Watergate and, and Vietnam, yep. but specifically um, trust in our elected officials. People, when, when asked, they say things like, uh, it seems like they're more interested in their own advancement than in ours. And they say things like, they're quote unquote selfish. Um, and so I do think that this topic is one of the factors that is eroding trust in the process. Now, I have to ask you, and there's, a, there's a relation to, to this particular part of the topic, right? Did you do your own Audible or did somebody else uh, perform the, um, the Audible version of your book? So my book in 2016, Too Dumb to Fail, I recorded it and, and ed i there's never been anything more brutal in my life <laughs> than recording an audiobook it is so hard and maybe it's just I've me with, with my voice so i swore i would never do it again 
So uh, there is a voice actor. No, I can tell you, I've heard positive things so far. I've been hearing positive feedback from people who are listening to it, which I'm I'm happy. I'm happy that they are. The reason why I asked that is, you know, the lifestyles portion of this really should be done in a Robin Leach accent, right? <laughs> I love it. The Clinton Foundation. <laughs> it's enormous. It's enormous. It's global, baby. No, I'm that kidding. is so good. <laughs> I did my own. I did my own. We should have talked a month ago, and I could have made that happen. (laughs) (laughs) Well, now you're now everybody be thinking it, right? But uh, I'm going to be thinking it when I play through that. I'm going to be. I'm going to be. I'm going to be sitting there, and my wife will be trapped in the car with me while I repeat everything in a Robin in a very bad Robin Lee. (laughs) I should add, but uh, yeah, I did my own. Uh, I recorded my own book too. And I, I know exactly what you mean. I actually had a really great producer for that. It was a local guy in St. Paul um, and it was a lot of fun. And um, so I didn't mind it so much, but yes, it is tedious, tedious oh work. And cool it goes thing, on forever. The cool thing is, A, it's refreshing your memory of what you wrote six months ago in advance of going out to talk about the book. Right. B, if there's a mistake, you as the author can change it in the audiobook, whereas the actors do not have the uh, authority to do that. But man, do you, it, it's grueling. Uh, a, lot, a lot of hot tea and honey and lemon yep. are, are required. It, it takes days to do. If you make a mistake, you got to start over at least the, the paragraph or the sentence. Oh, yeah. Uh, and then the other thing is, I didn't realize how many like foreign words and references we make that I don't actually know how to pronounce, you know, (laughs) like I I had a section, (laughs) I was talking about the French revolution, you know, and and I was mentioning some of the revolutionaries. I'm like, I do not know how to pronounce this name. I mean, I know Robespierre, but you know what I mean? Right. Yes. And uh, no, no, I totally get that. You know, I was just writing about, you know, places in america and there were a couple of place names that i had to go back and look up to make sure i didn't screw up uh i gotta tell you though the the most painful part of doing it for me was going through my text and realizing i'd made a mistake and it was too late to correct it yes <laughs> it was like they yeah. were minor there were very minor mistakes but it's like oh my god did i really i mean like a grammatical no, error I, trust nobody me. Thought. I feel your pain um and then there are, and what happens is no one will tell. Like, so right. once you start promoting the book, then people will come tell you too. Like, where were you six months ago? Well, no one knew about it. Um, and then their development. So, like for example, when I was writing this book, Ron DeSantis was only worth three hundred thousand dollars. Then he wrote a book, and now he's a millionaire. <laughs> and so my book is wrong. I say that he's not, but he is. So, uh, what are you going to do? Yeah, you know, and. and um... Yeah. And, and honestly, I, I guess I'll wrap up on this. And this is really specific, right? So, but I, I'm not trying to give away the story here. My feeling is that Barack Obama came to the Senate already starting to make money on his book. His first book was a legit literary success. His second book was terrible. <laughs> the Audacity of Hope. Uh, Dreams from My Father was actually a, it was a literary success. It was very well received. The Audacity of Hope was a campaign book. And it was this stupid sing-songy thing. I just, I I, I tried listening at about halfway through the book and I just uh, can't stand this any longer. Um, and um, his money was pretty, you could see where his money was coming from pretty well. I, I don't know that he was in the Senate long enough <laughs> to to cash in on this stuff so almost all of his stuff came from book deals uh now he's making it from you know netflix deals and development deals and that type of stuff now that he's out of office i I mean what did you find out about the obamas i mean do you think that the obamas were maybe cleaner on on this particular point than some other people or do you think that they were playing the same games um Yes, I think they were cleaner in the sense that I don't think that there was as much, you know, it's like no drama Obama. He got the job done. He made a lot of money. Um, there's the Netflix deal. There's some hypocrisy, right? During the COVID, he had, I think he had like, what was it, his 60th birthday or 65th? Some, oh, some yeah. big, some big yes. birthday during COVID uh, at the Hamptons or Sag Harbor or something, or Martha, yeah, Martha's Vineyard, it. probably, right? Martha's Vineyard. Martha's Vineyard. Six, yeah, I yeah. really pissed off everybody at Martha's Vineyard. Yeah. 
So, I mean, there's hypocrisy and there's like, you know, the he cashed in on book deals and Netflix, but I, I, it seems transparent. And, and so um, there's not, yeah, there's not a lot of, not a lot of, of Obama stuff in the book. Right. I but, wouldn't, because, I, mean, I wouldn't have expected it because again, I think yeah. most of that stuff was pretty, I mean, certainly we can also talk about the huge book advances that these guys got as they're exiting office, but they were exiting office. And unlike the Clintons, Nobody thought that these guys were going to run for office again. I know people talk about, oh, Michelle Obama will run for president. Michelle Obama has no interest in this. If she wanted to run for president, she would have done it, you know, three years ago. She would have done it it definitely three years ago. That's not on the plate for them. So if you're only in the Senate two years, I guess there's only (laughs) so much cash in you. (laughs) All right. Uh, Yeah. So, so what have we missed? I mean, we got a couple of minutes left. Uh, what have we missed? Well, we did. Uh, I think we covered it all, man. Uh, insider trading is, I think, the big thing we need to, That's in the my opinion, one. ban and ban individual stock trades. We talked about the revolving door of lobbying. We talked briefly about the book deals. We talked about um, spreading the wealth around. Like, so I would, I would ban hiring families on campaigns and congressional offices. You could volunteer, obviously. Um, I'm now in favor of term limits, which is something I used to oppose, but I've kind of come around on that issue. I think that would at least kind of uh, mitigate the damage that a politician could do over the course of decades of of, uh, of making money. Um, but basically, uh, you know, I think, you know, the book, if you look at the the subtitle, it talks about, you know, the swamp creatures and the ruling class and all that. Um, And I think there is, you know, kind of a salacious side of this book where you can look at like, I talk about like how rich, you know, how did Daryl Issa went from being an alleged car thief to making his (laughs) money, making his money, starting a car alarm business, you know? Um, So there's a lot of stories like that in the book about, uh, and some of them are kind of not even salacious. Like there's a guy named Kevin Hearn. I don't know if you know no, I don't who think he is. He's, they call him the Mick Congressman. He started off working at a McDonald's. Um, He saved enough money to buy a McDonald's. And now he's one of the richest members. Of, he, he owns multiple McDonald's franchises, raises all of his money for McDonald's managers or uh, owners, franchisees. And he's now one of the richest members of Congress. He's a Republican. From Oklahoma, and I kind of see that as as like an inspiring story, actually. So it's not sure. all it's not all negative, um, but at the end of the day, uh, and the other thing I'll say is I tried to as I was writing this book, you know, PJ o- O'Rourke, whom I really admired, passed away, and uh, you know, I'll never never try to be as or pretend to be as funny as PJ, but I did go out of my way to try to make it as fun and as funny and light while talking about a serious topic. Um, and so hopefully, as you're listening, as you're driving to Minnesota, uh, you betcha, um, that <laughs> will, you know, I, I even even though it's not going to be my voice, I'm hoping that that there'll be a little humor injected into a, a pretty serious topic. Well, I'm looking forward to that. I'm also looking forward to your next book, Completely Honest Politicians in America, a three-page pamphlet that will be coming up from <laughs> That will be Matt Lewis's next project. Uh, can't wait to see. Can't wait to see what kind of a book advantage you get for that one. But uh, but we'll we'll just we'll we'll read this one first. Uh, and uh, Filthy Rich Politicians is the book. And um, the Swamp Creatures, Latte Liberals, and Ruling Class Elites Cashing in on America is the subtitle of that. You can get it at Amazon. You can get it at Kindle, the uh, audiobook. You can get it hardcover. Uh, you can get it an audio CD for anybody who still does that. Um, and uh, and you can get it now. You can go to your local bookstore and pick it up there as well. It just came out on Tuesday of this week. Matt Lewis, thanks so much for being with us today. Thank you, Ed Morrissey.